Good afternoon. My name is Burton Lim, Assistant Curator of Mammalogy in the Department of Natural History at the Royal Ontario Museum. Uh, as you can see uh, in my background photo, I worked on the new ROM exhibition, Great Whales Up Close and Personal, that is currently showing at the museum. And today's virtual event is part of the public programming for this exhibit. So thank you for joining our Curator Conversations, a digital program that explores themes and subjects related to the ROM's collections and research that also incorporates professionals from other like-minded organizations. First, a big thanks to TD for their ongoing support of this programming event. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the ROM sits on what has been the ancestral lands of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Anishinaabek Nation, including the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, since time immemorial to today. As mentioned, today's program is in support of our current exhibition, Great Wills Up Close and Personal, uh, open now until March 20th of next year. Uh, thank you to lead exhibition patron, Nita and Don Reed and family, and supporting sponsor, Newfoundland and Labrador for making this exhibit possible. We'd also like to acknowledge the support of our Royal Exhibition Circle donors. Our guests for today's discussion include Jacqueline Miller, who is the mammal technician at the ROM as, uh, and is an uh, integral member of the Great Whales team. She was also instrumental in the 2014 exhibition, Out of the Depths, the Blue Whale Story, and helped with the, the recovery of the North Atlantic right whale that is on display in the current show, uh, and also my background photo. Dr. Moyer Brown is the senior scientist at the Canadian Whale Institute in New Brunswick. Her research includes studies on the distribution, population biology, and genetics of North Atlantic right whales. She was the lead author for the Fisheries and Oceans Canada 2009 report on the recovery strategy for the North Atlantic right whale in Canada as part of the Compliance with the Species at Risk Act. Moira's research focuses on the human-related threats to whales and identification of conservation measures to reduce the effect of human activities on right whale populations. She served as co-chair of the Canadian North Atlantic Right Whale Implementation Team, working with the shipping industry, Dalhousie University, the Canadian government, and the International Marine Organi Maritime Organization. She was instrumental in developing two conservation measures that substantially reduce the risk of vessel strikes on right whales in the Bay of Fundy and the waters south of Nova Scotia. Dr. Brown received two bachelor's degrees in environmental conservation and in, in, and in education from McGill University and her PhD in marine biology from the University of Guelph. She has many achievements and recognitions, including emeritus uh, scientist at the New England Aquarium, recipient of the Canadian uh, Environment Award and a Lifetime Achievement Award from the International Fund of Animal Were uh, Welfare. Today's presentation is one of a series of digital and in-person programs that will showcase the ROM's commitment to Canada's iconic Atlantic whales. We will begin with a short discussion around Moore's experiences in the field and the important work she does with the Canadian Whale Institute to help us understand and protect North Atlantic right whale populations. During the program, please submit questions via the Q&A feature on your screen, and we'll take some time at the end to answer your questions. So please join me in welcoming Jacqueline Miller and Moira Brown to begin the conversation on challenges and opportunities to research on the conservation of North Atlantic right whales. Welcome, Jacqueline and Moira. Hello, everyone. It's, it's really great to be here today, and it's really great to be talking to you again, Moira about this issue that is so, I know is so dear to your heart and has been uh, one of the anchor points of our exhibition. So I thought I'd like to start by asking you, um, you have a long and, and dedicated history with the, the Canadian Whale Institute and in North Atlantic right whale conservation, particularly around critical risks like the danger of vessel strikes. Can you take us to the beginning of all this? <laughs> You know, it, 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 first of all, hi everyone, and thank you for joining us for lunch. And, and thank you to the ROM for hosting this and, and for displaying North Atlantic right whales. It's such an iconic species in Canada uh, for so many different reasons. Uh, this all, I, I got started in this in 1985 when I uh, was lucky enough to get a volunteer internship with uh, studying North Atlantic right whales in the Bay of Fundy. And you never know where those internships are gonna lead. 36 years later, I've, I've had a career 
being able to pursue my curiosity and passion for North Atlantic right whales to try and help this species recover. And I just want to talk a little bit about the word vessel. So when we think of vessels, we think of large ships, like in this photograph, uh, which is a, a tanker in the Bay of Fundy with a right whale in the foreground. And But vessels and, and can, can be anything from, from a canoe to, to a vessel the size of a tanker or a container ship. So it's basically anything that is, that is floating and moving on the water uh, can present a disturbance or a risk to a North Atlantic right whale. Obviously, bigger vessels... Um, uh, just have means of detecting these animals. And let me just introduce you to the right whale for a moment. On the next slide, we have a photograph of a right whale swimming right towards you. And wow. it's kind of a funny looking picture. <laughs> funny looking. Um, but what we're seeing is the, the, the whale swimming right towards the, the viewer. The black material, the raised and roughened uh, black, black material on the skin of the head are callosities, like a callus from leaves, but these whales are, are have these throughout their lives. They erupt within the first few months of life, and that's how we distinguish individuals based on that callosity pattern. The, the light uh, cream color that you see is actually whale lice, and they live on the callosities. Uh, those bumps on the side are actually the lower lips that come up around the upper jaw, and the rostrum is from the very tip at the front of the picture all the way back to the blowholes. And that round bit in front, that part of the callosity, the whalers used to call it the bonnet of the whale. They thought it resembled a whaler's, uh, excuse me, a lady's bonnet. The whalers did go to sea for two years. So uh, I think they lost perspective <laughs> perhaps during that time. In the next photograph, we see the beautiful, beautiful and unique um, V-shaped blow on the top left. <coughs> Only right whales have a beautiful V-shaped blow like this. They don't have a dorsal fin, their backs are smooth. Their uh, flippers are shaped almost like the wing of a butterfly. And when they're getting ready to go down to the bottom to feed, they'll raise their flukes out of the water. And in the bottom right, you can see that uh, this is an example of a whale that has quite a few scars on it. And in fact, 85% of our cataloged whales have scars from, um, from entanglements. Uh, far fewer have scars from vessel strikes because only a very small vessel could injure a white whale, a large vessel, unfortunately. Um, usually results in a mortality because the, just the size difference between whales and, and vessels, large vessels is so, so huge. Wow, that, that's, that's incredibly beautiful. Uh, I just, uh, I love, I always love that V-shaped blow. We actually have that figured in a diagram in our exhibition so people can look for that and figure out how you use some of these, these features to distinguish between not only uh, species of whales, but individual whales, as, as Moira has, has alluded to. Um, I want to ask more, and I, I know uh, working on this exhibition, I've read a lot of books, and, um, and some of those books that you figured prominently in as, as an author. And it's often the North Atlantic right whale is coined the urban whale, and in a lot of this literature and, and in popular um, media as well. What exactly does it mean to be an urban whale? Well, the, this next slide will, will give you an idea how we came up with this name. So right whales are found along the east coast of Canada and the U.S. from, uh, from Florida, northeast Florida, all the way up uh, to the Gulf of St. Lawrence between Quebec, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and Newfoundland. And this is a very busy coastline because we can identify individuals over the years. So the photo ID project started in earnest in 1980, and that's curated at the New England Aquarium in Boston. And the one thing that's unique about the Right Whale Project is that all of us who contribute data to this project, we all contribute through what's called the North Atlantic Right Whale Consortium, and we all share. Mm -hmm. So if you contribute data, you get to use data from other investigators to, to enrich your analyses. And it, it's a wonderful collaborative project that is, uh, uh, is quite unique in the study of, of, of any large mammal. And in case you're trying to, to turn this whale's trajectory around, uh, population recovery was looking pretty good between 1980 and, and 2009. Population was increasing at about two and a half percent. We were starting to approach 500 animals in the population. Um, and then things changed starting in 2010. We started to see changes in distribution. I'm gonna get more to that a little bit later. Back to the urban whale, you can see this, uh, 
this migration pattern that is roughly along the East Coast. This is a very, very busy coast for marine transportation, for fishing, for recreational boating. Um, it is an, we call it an urbanized coastline. It's, it's not like being far out to sea away from, away from uh, marine transportation. You have a lot of vessels coming into nine ports between Florida and Boston. And then of course, major transportation coming in through the Gulf of St. Lawrence uh, into the Great Lakes. So these are all very big transportation corridors. And unfortunately, a, a lot of those areas intersect with where right whales are migrating. And so because we've been doing this photo ID for so many years, we know that the only known calving ground is down in Florida and the whales are there from December through March, roughly. Uh, they, mothers and calves migrate up along the coast in, in late March. But the rest of that time during the winter, January, February, we actually don't know where most of the other whales are still. Even after studying them for 40 years, we still don't know where the other adults are, the females who aren't giving birth or the juveniles. They do start to show up in Cape Cod Bay uh, in the springtime, uh, late winter, early spring, and then swing around out east of Cape Cod. That's the Cape Cod Bay and Great South Channel uh, green arrow. And then what they used to do is they used to move across the Gulf of Maine into the Bay of Fundy and south of Nova Scotia on Roseway Basin in the summertime. And occasionally you'd get the odd animal around the Gaspé Peninsula. And so this was the pattern, um, you know, up until about 2010. And if you look on the right hand side, you can see a heat map. And by that, I mean the warmest colors are in, in this case are indicating the highest level of vessel traffic. And in this case, it's commercial shipping. And if you look at that migration route of right whales and where their habitats are, and their feeding grounds, their feeding grounds are often in deep water, fairly close to shore. And that helps with upwellings and, and aggregation of plankton. These whales feed on plankton. It's not microscopic, you can see it, but it's about the size of not even a grain of rice, perhaps a grain of couscous. Uh, but that overlaps with, with a lot of heavy shipping, heavy meaning lots of vessels, um, year round in all of these areas. And so it's, it's really an accidental overlap because the vessels also wanna get a little bit away from the coast for safe navigation, but not too far so as to have a, a fairly direct route. And then of course, a lot of vessels are also approaching the coastline and the whales are migrating up and down along the coast and the whales are approaching. So you end up with intersection points that um, have, have unfortunately resulted in quite a bit of mortality for this species. So, so part of being an urban whale is because uh, we've urbanized the coastlines with industry and with our recreation, with just, just our cities too. I mean, there are a lot of big cities right on the coast for, for obvious reasons, everyone likes the water. But I wanna get back to the commercial industry again for a moment. Uh, and vessel strikes have been a leading cause of current mortality risk for North Atlantic right whales. And, uh, and, and the shipping industry has figured prominently in this risk, particularly uh, the, 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 the big ships, the big cargo, um, super cargo ships and the goods they bring us. But they've also been uh, part of the responses necessary to reduce that risk. Can, can you walk us through what's been going on? Yeah, so the, the first known vessel strike uh, was actually in 1986 uh, off of Boston. The first one in Canada was in 1992. Uh, in the Bay of Fundy, and and uh, the the carcass actually someone actually saw this whale take its last breath, um, reported it. The carcass was retrieved and brought to Gramanand Island, and we performed a necropsy, which is an animal autopsy, and uh, and actually this whale's name was Delilah, and her bones are displayed in the New Brunswick Museum in St. John, and so that was sort of our first um, large right whale skeleton on display in a museum. So in 1992, um, one of my colleagues and I went to visit Fundy Traffic. And Fundy Traffic uh, were a group of operators based in St. John, New Brunswick. And they were monitoring all of the vessels going up and down the shipping lanes uh, in the Bay of Fundy. And in fact, in this next picture, you'll see where the shipping lanes are now located. Um, in 1992, so if it, the, the black multi-sided figure with Graham and Ann Basin, that's the critical habitat now for right whales. Previously, the shipping lanes ran right through the middle of that area because they had been put in place uh, by the International Mag Maritime Organization and Transport Canada back in the early 1980s. There was no awareness of right whales there at that time. The studies here only started in 1980. And so we had an accidental overlap really between just putting the shipping lanes right up the middle of the Bay of Fundy and where the deepest water was that aggregated the right whales. 
and, and uh, excuse me, aggregated, well, aggregated the right whales because it aggregated the plankton where they were feeding. Mm-hmm. And it worked with the shipping industry, with local whale watchers, uh, with the fishing industry, environmental groups, Transport Canada and Fisheries and Oceans to figure out a new path that would be safe for ships to travel. You don't want to risk uh, any navigational hazard. Uh, and in fact, potentially striking a whale is a navigational hazard to a vessel. And so the lanes were moved to the east about six miles, uh, excuse me, six kilometers. And then there was a little turnout put in just uh, just north of the, the black uh, outlined critical habitat for vessels that were going to the west. And this was put in place. We started working on this in 1999 after we had three known uh, right whale deaths in the Bay of Fundy that were attributed to vessel strikes. And again, necropsies on each of these animals, which takes multiple days. You have not even been to them. Uh, it's a huge undertaking. And so, um, you know, knock on wood, there hasn't been uh, a large whale mortality in the shipping lanes since since this was moved. And uh, there's a second area where right whales aggregate in Canada, in southern Canada, Roseway Basin, south of Nova Scotia. And this area didn't have uh, a regular shipping lane designated, but it had an area, uh, there were ships, the ships took normal paths. So they sort of had routes of habitual use. They weren't actually designated shipping lanes. And so we went back to the International Maritime Organization, the same groups again, the biologists, Transport Canada, DFO approval on this and, and whale watchers, the fishing industry, because one thing, when, when you do something on the ocean, it affects many, many other players. Mm-hmm. And the Roseway Basin area to be avoided was recognized by the International Maritime Organization as well and put in place uh, in 2008. And I'm gonna show you something in the next slide that'll give you an idea of the response from the shipping industry. So the Bay of Fundy shipping lanes are mandatory. So the ships had to stay in the lanes, but this area that we put in place south of Nova Scotia, the image on the top left, June to September 2000, uh, excuse me, 2007, shows you what the ship traffic was like through this right whale area before uh, the measures were put in place. The second image on the top shows you just in October, just a matter of months, we had 70% compliance for vessels avoiding this area. The one below shows you the second year of implementation, 80% compliance. And so the industry really embraced this. Um, You know, I've never met a mariner, fisherman, uh, shipper, uh, sea captain. I've never met anyone that wants to strike a whale. These are accidents that happen, but the shipping industry needs help. And and so does the fishing industry to, to not interact with these whales simply because, you know, you just can't see a small right whale from the bridge of a large ship or, or even a smaller vessel. Very, very hard to detect. So this was all monitored um, through either academia at Dalhousie University or through NGOs like Canadian Whale Institute. We wrote letters to all of the ships that avoided this area saying, thank you for avoiding. And then we sort of had the nasty gram. <laughs> it wasn't very nasty. We wrote letters to the ships that continue to travel through the area and say, hey, you know, 80% of your colleagues are avoiding this area. Can you do that too? And we had really good response for many, many years. Um, however, uh, an NGO doing this is certainly not, doesn't have the, the, uh, the strength of, of a government agency doing this that has enforcement powers. And you can see in the graph in the bottom, it just shows how things sort of we're bubbling along nicely at about 80% compliance. And then when we dip into the red, compliance is starting to fall off. But this is also coinciding with a period of time when we started to see some changes in, in right whale distribution. And, and there, was, there were stories in the news about how right whales were shifting elsewhere. But, but before we get into that, if I can just go to the next slide. Canada really led the charge on, on uh, Uh, amending the Bay of Fundy shipping lanes and on the designation of an area to be avoided south of Nova Scotia. And our colleagues in the US were also doing their bit in the other habitat areas that I've showed you. So Cape Cod Bay, that spring habitat, the Florida calving area, recommended routes to concentrate the traffic so that you could, so that they could survey the areas where the traffic was going by aircraft. And then those aircraft, the observers on the aircraft could notify the industry when there were any whales around. Uh, uh, Boston shipping lanes were amended in 2007, and then a speed limit was put in in areas where there was just an intersection point, vessels traveling along the coast in roughly a north-south direction and whales approaching and leaving the coast roughly in an east-west direction. The, the, you couldn't, there was no avoidance possible uh, by rerouting or anything, and so then a 10-knot seasonal speed limit was put in place. 
Uh, and then finally in 2009, there was a large area to be avoided put in place off of Boston and, and further modification to the shipping lanes. And this was all about um, trying to get whales and ships separated in time and space so that they didn't interact. And so again, on the right-hand side, you can see two images, uh, uh, sort of the typical large ship that we think of when we think of vessels, but also small boats like those two folks in a kayak, you know, and you can see the right whale right in behind them. Uh, and, you know, you just, these, these whales just need a little bit more room to live, to not be disturbed. Uh, and also uh, not to put kayakers at risk at, at being anywhere near a rather large, large animal. Yeah, you know, it's so important and, and to rem remind people too, as you said, it's a bigger bigger thing than just industry. This has to involve uh, be involvement at the government level and people need to remember, especially we're coming into an election and you all have that one piece of power in your hand and on that voting ballot and you, you know, get your members of parliament can sit, answer some of these uh, pressing questions. I want to go back, though, to that change. Uh, th things suddenly changed for the North Atlantic right whale leading into 2017, which was that beginning of that devastating mortality event. Uh, and, and, and there's now irrefutable evidence that the oceans and their ecologies are stressed. Uh, has climate impact this? Is there a connection? And exactly what happened in 2017? And, and, and what was that? What, what was going on with the right whales? Well, let's look at the next slide, Jackie. So people are pretty familiar with this map of the East Coast of uh, Canada and the US now. And uh, I'm gonna direct your attention to some major changes that we actually started to notice around 2011. So we've talked about the critical habitats and, and actually the whole Gulf of Maine is a critical habitat now that was changed in 2016 in the US, but I've left the smaller critical habitats in place just for descriptive purposes here. So the Bay of Fundy in Canada, Rosaway Basin, those were the summer habitats, Great South Channel in the Southeast US. So all the ones that are circled in red, all of a sudden we had a pretty substantial decline in sighting numbers from, from the previous three mm. decades. So, so that was a huge change wow. for calves being born as well. Strangely enough, in Cape Cod Bay, as we saw this decline in, in the other areas in the winter, later spring and summer, we started to see an increase in the number of right whales using Cape Cod Bay. So I started an aerial survey program down there in 1997, and we would see 25, 50, maybe 75 right whales during the winter season. And all of a sudden, 250, 300 individuals were showing up there in, in, in Cape Cod Bay, which isn't really all that and that has persisted to this day for 10, 11 years. Then south of Martha's Vineyard, there seems to be an area where you can find right whales almost year round. And this is an area where they're developing uh, and doing surveys in response for uh, uh, potential wind farm development. And then of course, the increase in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. So sightings actually started to increase there in 2015, possibly earlier, but quite honestly, it took the biologists five years to find it. So our sightings dropped off in the summer and fall, early fall in Bay of Fundy and Rosaway Basin. And it really did take us a while to twig into the fact that, that there were many more right whales in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. It's an area that had never been well surveyed in the past. Uh, and it ends up being uh, the summer home, spring, summer and early fall home for about half of the North Atlantic right whales now. A big part of this, this is really climate change in action. It's all about the food. So if we look at the next slide, remembering you know, the map in, in the back of your mind, um, this is an image of a right whale skim feeding in Cape Cod Bay. So right whales both uh, uh, feed at the surface in a place like Cape Cod Bay where the plankton is up near the surface. And that's a big, uh, big bowl of tasty plankton on the right-hand side. Yeah. Tried, it actually tastes pretty good. Yeah. Um, and uh, the photograph on the right-hand side is a drone image uh, from a colleague and you can see the baleen that filters the plankton out of the water down below that rostrum. And so you can see the, the, the blowholes and the top of the rostrum all the way to the bonnet and that baleen kind of coming out down below. The Gulf of Maine is well studied. It's warming up faster than any similar body of water in the world. Bottom temperatures, probably six degrees Celsius higher than they were a decade ago. Plankton, and the kind of plankton that right whales feed on have a temperature threshold, just like we do. We don't like it when it's too warm, we can get into air conditioning. Plankton can't swim. They are at the whim and whimsy of the currents. 
And so what's happened in the Gulf of Maine over the last few years, as, and this has been uh, well assessed due to a lot of sampling, is that the, the, the abundance of plankton is a lot less than it was for many decades. It's just like in COVID when you go home and, 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 and your favorite restaurant's closed. This is what's happened to the right whales. The door has closed on a number of their really favorite restaurants. All of those areas that I showed in red, Bay of Fundy, south of Nova Scotia, Gulf of Maine. And so about half of the North Atlantic right whales have moved up into the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Uh, there were a couple of mortalities in 2015, but 2017 was a, just a devastating year for these species. And, and actually, let's go have a look at the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Uh, in the next slide. So the area that we're talking about um, is a very, very large one. This is the largest habitat area that we know of for right whales that we've identified. And so if I can refer you to the uh, sort of the lower left-hand map that is multicolored, pink and green, um, the area where there is a diagonal uh, a rectangular box sort of that's on the slope there, that is called the Shediac Valley. And that's where the right whales have mostly relocated to. That's where we find them in the highest concentrations. It's not the only place we find them in, in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, but that is where we find them. And previous to 2017, prior to 2017, none of these colors and lines and letters or anything were on the Gulf of St. Lawrence. There were no protection measures in place to protect right whales from vessel strikes and gear entanglements because it really wasn't a primary habitat for them. It was barely even a, a, an occasional habitat for them. A few had been seen around the gas bay, but that's about it. But in 2015, in that Shediac Valley, some colleagues uh, conducted an aerial survey and, and found a high concentration of right whales in one day, 35 in one day, and it was the highest that had been seen in the Gulf ever. And then the numbers have just gone up uh, from there. In 2017, very quickly, the area that you see in pink, after, the, after we determined that those 12 uh, dead right whales, a number of them were necropsied, not all of them could be recovered, but a number of them were. Um, and we determined that there were, uh, there were vessel strike mortalities and gear entanglements that had, been, um, uh, that had been implicated. And so, this was no time for an NGO to try and figure out how to protect right whales. The government stepped in, Transport Canada and Fisheries and Oceans. So Transport Canada is responsible for marine safety and the movement of ships, and DFO is responsible for fishing and, and for whales. And so Port Canada stepped in quite quickly and put in a 10 knot uh, speed limit in the Gulf. And, and that light pink area that you see was, was pretty much what was put in place in 2017. Uh, also, fisheries were were closed early. It, it was an unfortunate year with the with the fisheries in that it was uh, it was a year in which the quota was much higher for snow crab that year, and it was uh, there were a lot of new fishers in the in the fleet, and uh, and the season was quite long, and so it was it was just a huge, um, almost like a perfect storm, an accidental overlap of of mm -hmm. gear and vessels. Uh, as we have gone on, so the same groups in, that, that were involved in, in the early work with Bay of Fundy and Roseway Basin um, at, in academia at Dalhousie and now UNB as well and myself, we got together with the industry and with government representatives to, to try and refine this as, as time has gone on. And so now what you're seeing is that static pink area that is a 10 knot slowdown for the whole season the, that stretches all the way up to the Mingan Islands where right whales are also found. And then the A, B, C, D are areas where vessels can proceed at normal op operational speeds. These are not areas where we find a lot of right whales. We do find some, but these areas are monitored by aircraft and also by gliders equipped with hydrophones. And when whales are detected, vessels are required to slow down in the appropriate lettered grid uh, for 15 days until that area can be cleared and shown that the whales have moved on. On the lower right-hand side, you can see this is for 2020, and so this was <laughs> during the COVID year. Uh, all the brown lines are surveys, aerial surveys that Canada is doing. Uh, the gray dots are right whales, uh, visual sightings of right whales. The red dots are detections, acoustic detections, and the yellow dots are possible acoustic detections. Um, so this is a, a multi-million dollar, a huge program to try and protect these right whales from what ails them. The box 
you see on the lower left-hand side uh, on the diagonal is a seasonal slowdown that actually is in the core of the right whale area and, and their vessels are only permitted to go eight knots or less. So this, get this a is, sense of the closures for fishing. So this is an immense new and rapidly changing uh, situation. And it, it certainly got all Canadians that are keeping up with, with whale news on, on edge. And certainly I'm sure it's gotten all of you folks and your colleagues on, on edge. Particularly, as you said, with COVID, when we, we had a less, less, a, a less, less ability to keep on top of things. I, I want to maybe, I mean, we're, we're running a little towards the end of our time here, and I see there's a number of questions pouring in. So I, I want to close on this by, by thinking, you know, the things are really critical for the North Atlantic right whale. Their numbers are down. Calving has been down. This year seems to be uh, an, a bit of an improvement, and 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 there is still cause for hope. Uh, can, can you tell us a bit about the successes and 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 what we might what might be looking to in the future? Yes, first of all, the buy-in and compliance by the shipping industry is tremendous. Ninety-nine percent compliance with these measures. The fishing industry as well are relocating their gear and they're experimenting with other kinds of gear to fish that'll have less impact on the whales. They're going out after the end of the season, recovering any gear that was lost during the season. So there really is a tremendous, tremendous effort. This year, there were 18 calves born, nine wow. moms, fairly young moms, were had been seen previously in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Interestingly enough, the nine older moms haven't been seen in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. So wherever those other half of the right whales are going, they're contributing to reproduction as well. This is the most number of calves born since 2013. Wow. I'm going to give up on the right whale. No one's giving up because this animal demonstrated that it can recover if we can reduce mortality. They were growing at two and a half percent for two decades until a habitat shift as a result of climate change. They've found a new restaurant. We're doing our best to keep food on the table and keep them safe while they're there. And uh, I'm optimistic with the tremendous support of the, 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 the mariners on the water and they deserve all the credits, the mariners that are changing their operations to make room for right whales. And so really they, the fishermen and the and, and uh, the sea captains and their bridge crews deserve all the credit in the world. So really, really, really important. Um, you know, the ROM also has been trying to make the best of, of the bad news and make something good of it. And and Aaron, I'm wondering if you could pop up maybe a, an image of, of our of our right whale that we were we salvaged from that devastating event in 2017. So this is Alasuinu. Um, who is a big male, tracked for 37 plus years. Uh, there he is swimming in his lifetime. And I wonder if you could just bring up the exhibition image. So we, he, he died of devastating circumstances as Moira's discussed that happened in 2017. And, and we were lucky enough to recover him. And here he is on display in the exhibition. And, and I really would like to take a second to invite people to to come down and visit the ROM a, a, as you can, and and you know, in, in with all the restrictions in place, it's a very safe place to be. We've put a lot in there to make sure that your visit is safe, and there's an awful lot you can learn and ways that you can engage and find out how you can be a part of this uh, this solution too. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Burton uh, for closing remarks, and uh, and I see that there are questions coming up, so I'm excited about that. Yes, well, thank you very much to Moira Brown and Jackie Miller for joining us uh, t in today's program uh, for, uh, and also for a very uh, interesting and stimulating uh, discussion on um, the conservation of North Atlantic right whales. And also hope that, uh, as Jackie mentioned, that the audience uh, would be able to visit uh, the ROM special exhibitions, including great whales up close and personal, now that the museum is open to the public. So uh, we'll be answering uh, some of your questions for the next few minutes. Uh, as a reminder, uh, they can be submitted by the Q&A feature uh, on your screen. Uh, okay, so the first uh, question um, starts off with a comment. So uh, thank you for the super interesting presentation so far. I was just wondering what the process is in negotiating these alternate routes or lowered speed limits with the industry. Uh, how much power do scientists uh, or relevant policymakers have in enforcing any restrictions? 
I was just checking uh, out the North uh, Atlantic right whale uh, website and it looks like the majority of ships are ignoring a speed reduction in Cabot Bay. Well, it's different in both countries. I've lived in both Canada and the US and worked with the shipping industry in both countries and, and the two countries have different legislations. Uh, measures put in the States, put in place in the US have been in place since 2009 and haven't been adapted to changing uh, uh, migrations yet. I believe it's in the works. And uh, a lot of the measures are voluntary. Um, in Canada, uh, we are primarily using mandatory measures, uh, which are enforced by Transport Canada. So if the speed limit's 10 knots and you're going 10.1 knots on, the, on, on a ship, you will get a call from Transport Canada and they will investigate every case going just that 0.1 knot over the speed limit. Also, the measures are adapted each year. We meet uh, several times a year. We have a large committee of, of industry members and academics uh, and, and just people who are on the water studying right whales uh, to figure out how we can adapt the measures. This has got to be a compromise. It's got to work for both right whales and it's got to work for the shipping industry. It's an important marine corridor as well. So what's good about the Canadian measures is as we learn more about right whales and as other incidences have happened, we've been able to modify them and increase the measures and increase the, just the geographic scope as well as the, the spatial time during the year. Uh, to maximize the protection for right whales in those areas. So it's, it's always an ongoing process in Canada. Uh, it's always under, under review every few months uh, to make sure it's working. Okay, great. Uh, I've got an interesting question here. Uh, so how does cohabitation work for right, right whales as they change locations for breeding and living? So I, I guess, how, how does this affect their behavior? Um, uh, with these well, species. this would be one of the other embarrassing things. We don't actually know where the mating ground is for North Atlantic right whales. After 40 years, you think we might have found that, and, and uh, we thought we had, and as soon as we published the paper, the whales uh, ceased to go there. Uh, <laughs> most, of the, most of the calves are born December, January, February, so that the gestation or pregnancy is about a year, a uh, year to 13 months, so the real mating must go on uh, November, December, early January uh, is perhaps just where those animals are aggregating at the time. Uh, the, the whale uh, pictured behind Burton, uh, 12, uh, 1207, is a known father. We've been taking skin samples from these whales since 1988 and doing DNA studies. So we know, for example, that 1207... Um, uh, has a, a daughter and a, and a son in the right whale population. We know who he mated with. That may be something even the whales don't know. We're not sure. Because um, they do engage in, in, in tremendous uh, social active groups that appear to be mating groups, but it does occur all year long. So they do get bigger and more energetic as you get towards what we presume is the mating time. But uh, that time of the year, November, December, we don't actually know yet where to go look for right whales at that time of the year. So they still hold a lot of secrets um, from us. Uh, yeah, uh, the sort of a related question here is, um, is there any interest in tagging the animals to see where they go or is the risk of a tag too much for their current status? Exactly. So in the early years, uh, there was a, a rather extensive program to uh, implant satellite Transmitters, transmitters that are monitored by satellites into right whales. Uh, we did get concerned that this could cause injury to the animal, and uh, we didn't want to risk uh, uh, reducing the population even by one. Uh, this was, you know, it's a path for infection uh, into the whale, and the technology just isn't quite there yet. Uh, you know, you read about uh, tagging birds and all of that, but but. Mm -hmm. and on whales have to be pressure tested to go very deep in the ocean. So the tags are quite large and quite heavy. And so the technology is really not sufficient yet. It has been done on other species and other places. And the other unfortunate thing is right whales like to go down to the bottom and rub in the mud. Sometimes they come up to the surface and their heads are covered in mud. And uh, if you have an antenna of a, of a tag sticking out of your side, that gets bumped off or it gets broken. And so the technology is not there yet. I wish it was because we'd like to know where the, where the other half of the right whales go in the summertime and, and we can only best protect them if we know where they go. So hopefully improvements in that technology will lead us down that road in the next few decades. And Maura, it's true too that those tags, even, even when they're safely deployed, uh, they have a longevity. They don't keep tracking data forever and ever. It's a very short period of time, is it not? 
It is a short period of time, uh, you know, maybe three months if the tag is successful, maybe four. We've, we actually have satellite monitored transmitters that we sometimes attach to entangled whales if there's trailing line. And we have learned a little bit about whale movements from that. But on the other hand, this is an injured whale that's entangled towing gear and a tag. So it's not the most ideal situation. So uh, hopefully improvements in satellite technology will be there. And, and, and even now there are efforts to try and detect whales using satellites from space. Um, working on trying to detect whales, uh, for example, this past summer in, in Cape Cod Bay and the Gulf of St. Lawrence, when we're doing our research, comparing satellite images to see if the whales can actually be detected remotely in that fashion. It, it's pretty hard. It's early days yet in that technology. Yes. Uh, yeah, there's a couple of questions that um, are pretty similar. Um, are there other whale species or marine mammals that are affected by shipping? Yes, unfortunately, um, there are a lot of species that are affected by shipping uh, in different areas. So blue whales as well in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, um, uh, on the west coast of Canada and the U.S., uh, fin whales, humpbacks. So these are all species that commonly feed near shore, near shipping routes, and, uh, and, and again, can't be detected at night, can't be scared away by noise, uh, there was actually an experiment done a few years ago with right whales where noise was put into the water and, and, and all the whale did was come up and just swim slightly below the surface when, when the noise was being played. And that would be the last place you would want to have a right whale. You know, these big ships, gosh, I'm going to say it in feet, 65 feet. Some of them are 65 feet down into the water. That's a body length or more of a right whale. And so they have quite a big footprint. What we see at the surface of a, uh, with, a with a large ship is, is there, you know, it's like an iceberg. There's a lot more below the surface. So um, it's, uh, it's a problem for many, many of the large whales. Yes. Uh, and I think this might be uh, our last question. I guess the time is uh, quickly running out. Uh, it, it's, you sort of touched upon it in your last answer. Um, uh, how does noise from ships affect whales uh, to communicate? Well, the way we've learned about this is by having hydrophones in the water, fixed hydrophones in areas where there's shipping and there's whales. And what happens is, is when a whale, uh, excuse me, when a ship goes through a whale area, the noise of the ship essentially is sonifies that. So sort of like us going to a concert and, and it's really hard to hear uh, what your dates having to say because there's so much background noise from the music. And so same kind of thing, it's called masking and it means that it affects their ability to communicate with one another uh, primarily. And, and it also affects our ability to detect whales in shipping lanes using acoustic. And so uh, there's a lot of work being done in engineering, marine engineering to try and design quieter ships, more efficient ships. Uh, so again, I think there's, there's hope on the horizon to improve the situation. Uh, there's a lot of effort around the world to improve how we are making use of, of the ocean environment. Uh, it's, it, you know, time is of the essence in all of this. We're seeing changes on, on the orders of decades, not, not lifetimes. Yes, uh, yes, I, I guess um, that, that, that's, I think that's one thing that uh, Jack and I found out uh, as we were planning uh, the exhibition is that, you know, there's a lot of, you know, things that we don't know, you know, just basic biology about not only, you know, North Atlantic right was, but you know, whales in general. Um, so I'd just like to thank uh, Moira and Jackie for, again, a very interesting and fascinating discussion on conservation of North Atlantic right whales. And uh, we hope uh, to see our audience again for the next digital event or in person at the museum and at the Great Whales exhibition. Uh, details of all upcoming ROM at Home online programs can be found on the museum's website and our social media channels. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks everyone. Very much. And thank you, Maura.